Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out. And in the video today, did people ever really put crocodiles in moats? Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Hims. If you're a man who wants to keep his hair, not lose it like me, well, Hims they cut through all of the medical BS and get right to the point at an affordable price. In addition to that, they take your privacy really seriously. So just go to forhims.com forward slash brain food and try Hims for just five dollars while supplies last. Now I'm gonna talk a bit more about Hims later in the video, but for now, let's just get on with it. A common image in pop culture is that of a castle moat filled to the brim with water and hungry crocodiles. So did anyone ever actually do this? Well, the short answer is that it doesn't actually appear so. That said, while there's no known documented instances of crocodiles intentionally being put into moats, we do know of at least one castle that had, and still has in fact, a moat full of bears. Before we get to that, and why crocodiles in moats are probably not the best idea in the world, or at least not a very efficient use of resources if your concern was really defense of a fortress, we should address the fact that the common image most people have in their heads of a moat isn't exactly representative of what historical moats actually looked like. To begin with, moats have been around seemingly as long as humans have had a need of protecting a structure or area, with documented instances of them appearing everywhere from ancient Egypt to slightly more modern times around certain Native American settlements. And of course, there are countless examples of moats being used throughout European history. In many cases, however, these moats were little more than empty pits dug around a particular piece of land or property. Water-filled moats indeed were something of a rarity. You see, unless a natural source of water was around, maintaining an artificial moat filled with water required a lot of resources to avoid the whole thing just turning into a stinking cesspool of algae and biting bugs. As with artificial ponds constructed on certain wealthy individuals' estates, these would have to be regularly drained and cleaned, then filled back up to keep things from becoming putrid. Of course, if one had a natural flowing water source nearby, some of these problems could be avoided, but in the end, it turns out a water-filled moat isn't actually that much more effective than an empty one at accomplishing the goal of protecting a fortress. And as for putting crocodiles or alligators in them, introducing such animals to a region beyond being quite expensive if not their native habitat is also potentially dangerous if the animals get out. Again, all this while not really making the act of conquering a fortress that much more difficult, so really little payoff for the extra cost of maintaining said crocodiles. Unsurprisingly, from this outside of a legend that we're going to get to shortly, there doesn't appear to be any known documented cases of anyone intentionally putting crocodiles or alligators into their water-filled moats. It should also be mentioned here that while at first glance it would appear that the key purpose of a moat is to defend against soldiers attacking at the walls, they were often actually constructed with the idea of stopping soldiers under the ground. You see, a technique favored since ancient times for breaching cities, fortresses, and fortified positions was simply to dig tunnels below any walls that surrounded the position and then intentionally let them collapse, bringing part of the wall above that section tumbling down. Eventually, this was accomplished by the use of explosives like gunpowder, but before this, a more simple method was to cart a bunch of tinder into the tunnel at the appropriate point and set the whole thing ablaze. The idea was here that once all of the people digging the tunnel had left it, you'd put the kindling in, burn it, that would burn the support beams, and the tunnel would collapse. If all went as planned, the wall above said collapsed tunnel would also collapse. To get around this really effective form of breaching fortifications, moats would be dug as deeply as possible around the fortification, sometimes until the diggers reached bedrock. If a natural source of water was around, surrounding the fortress with water was a potential additional benefit over the dry pit at stopping such tunneling. Either way, beyond making tunneling more difficult or practically impossible, dry and wet moats, of course, also helped dissuade above-ground attacks as well, thanks to the moats being quite good at limiting an enemy's use of siege weaponry. In particular, devices such as battering rams are rendered almost entirely useless in the presence of a large moat. However, the advent of later weapons such as trebuchets made moats much less effective overall. However, they still proved to be a formidable barrier capable of kneecapping a direct assault on a castle's walls. 
All of this being said, though, it wasn't as if proud moat owners didn't put anything in them. There are plenty of ways to beef up moat defenses without the need for water and crocodiles. Pretty much anything that slows down an enemy's advance works well. And better yet, you could put something in that moat that is so daunting it simply deters the attack altogether. In fact, archaeological surveys of moats have found evidence of things like stinging bushes having once been grown throughout some moats. Whether these were intentionally planted on the part of the moat owners, or just a byproduct of having a patch of land that they left unattended for years at a time, isn't entirely clear. However, it doesn't seem too far-fetched to think that this may have been intentional in some cases. As you might imagine, wading through stinging or thorny plants while arrows and rocks and the like are raining down at you from above wasn't exactly top on people's lists of things to do. As for moats that were filled with water, while filling them with crocodiles or alligators wasn't seemingly something anyone did, some savvy castle owners did fill them with fish, giving them a nice private fishery. As mentioned, artificial ponds built for this purpose were also sometimes a thing for the ultra-wealthy, functioning both as a status symbol, given maintaining such was incredibly expensive, and a great source of food year-round. Alright, so moving back to the dry bed moats, when not just leaving them as a simple dug pit or planting things meant to slow enemy troops in them, it does appear that at least in some rare instances, fortress owners would put dangerous animals in them. As we mentioned though, this is kind of rare and it was probably done more as a status symbol than actually being an effective deterrent for enemy troops. The most famous example of this is probably at Krumlov Castle in the Czech Republic, where there exists something that is most aptly described as a bear moat. It is located between the castle's first and second courtyard. So when exactly this practice started has been lost to history, but the earliest known documented reference to the bear moat dates back to 1707. We also don't really know why they started doing this. It's possible that it was designed to serve as a warning to potential intruders, but it was probably also a status symbol or more likely just both. The castle's grisliest residents were tended to by a designated bear keeper until around the early 19th century when the practice ceased. This changed again in 1857 when the castle's then resident noble Karl Zu Schwarzenberg acquired a pair of bears from nearby Transylvania intent on reviving the tradition. From that moment onwards, outside of a brief lapse in the late 19th century, the castle's moat has almost always contained at least one bear. Today, the bears are most definitely completely for show, and each year, bear-themed celebrations are held at Christmas and on the bears' birthdays, during which children bring the bears presents. Now, if bears are not your thing, Wilhelm V, the Prince Regent of Bavaria in the late 16th century, supposedly kept both lions and a leopard in the moat of Trausnitz Castle while he lived there. However, again, it appears that Prince Wilhelm just kept the animals more for show and fun than he did for actual defense. Beyond dangerous creatures, his moat also contained pheasants and a rabbit run. Okay, so moving back to crocodiles being put in moats. The earliest reference to something like this, though seemingly just a legend, appears to be the legend of the Crocodrilo de Casal Nuevo. This story is recounted by the 19th and 20th century historian and politician Benedetto Croce in his Neapolitan Stories and Legends. In that castle, there was a moat under the level of the sea, dark, humid, where the prisoners, who they want to more strictly castigate, were usually put. When all of a sudden they started to notice with astonishment that from there the prisoners disappeared, did they escape? How? Put a tighter and new guest inside there, one day they saw an unexpected and terrifying scene from a hole hidden in the moat, a monster. A crocodile entering, and with its jaws, it grasped for the legs, the prisoner, and dragged him to the sea to eat him. Rather than kill said creature, the guards decided to make the fearsome creature an executor of justice, sending prisoners condemned to death to meet their ends in its toothy maw. Exactly where the crocodile came from and when this supposedly happened does depend on which version of the legend you consult, though our favorite version suggests that Queen Joanna II smuggled it over to Naples from Egypt sometime in the 15th century with the sole intention of feeding her many, many lovers to it. A consistent element in most versions of the legend is that the beast bit off more than it could chew when it tried to eat a leg of a giant horse, which ultimately choked it to death. Of course, this is generally thought to be nothing more than a legend with no evidence that it actually ever occurred, or even exactly when. At least the story does show that the idea of a crocodile in a moat isn't just something found in modern pop culture.
Alright, so I really hope you enjoyed that video. Now, I'd just like to take a short minute to tell you about HIMSS. Now, HIMSS provides guys with real solutions to problems related to hair, skin, and certain parts of the male body that don't work so great as we get older. Doctors are great, but we all know that doctor's offices can be less than great. There's wait times, awkward conversations, potentially high-priced medication, or things that your insurance might not cover. And then right on the other side of the spectrum, we've got buying drugs from sketchy websites on the internet. That's been a thing for a while, you've probably seen the messages in your spam folder, but it's really time for these sketchy websites to be gone because HIMSS is here and they offer medical grade prescription and non-prescription science-based medications at an affordable price. They offer generic equivalents to expensive name brand medications, which makes them super affordable. And look, hair loss affects 66% of men by 35. Me, personally, I was well within the 20th percentile losing mine at about 25. And look, if this existed a few years ago, I would be on it. I mean, I really wish HIMSS existed 10 years ago when my hairline started going backwards. But seriously, there are medications out there that help with this. And if you go to 4 forward slash brain food, you can have a virtual visit with a doctor and get a month trial of their comprehensive hair kit for just $5 a month plus tax. Cut out the middleman, cut out the expensive drugs and the insurance companies, or not if you don't have them, and then get the science-based medication you need at a fraction of the price. It's private, it's cheaper, it's more convenient. There's just really no reason not to. You can support this show by going to 4 forward slash brain food and try hymns for just $5 a month plus tax. See website for full details. So again, check out hymns.com forward slash brain food today. And as always, thanks to hymns for sponsoring, and thank you for watching.